And now I would like to introduce our speaker today. We proudly introduce Sonia Mera Chabla, who is a multidisciplinary artist and researcher who works on at the intersection of art and science and exploring the themes of ecology, sustainability and conservation. She works on a variety of media ranging from photography, um, printmaking, painting, video, and all the transmedia installation. Her practice is linked to an ethics and even politics of multi-species coexistence and cohabitation. Her research has been seen as a political act in which she collaborates with climate change scientists, ecologists, microbiologists, but also as well as fishermen, farmers, indigenous people who speak from very deep reserves of their traditional wisdom. Her artworks bring together a variety of impulses, ranging from microscopic details of bacterial, microbial cultures, to documentary cinematic studies of marginalized groups, whose eco-sensitive occupations have suffered as a result of the decline of their environment, our environments. So during the talk today on human nature interactions through a multi-species lens and art science worldview, she will come and guide us to think about how her art and science engagement projects and ongoing research in Scotland at the North, North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean and her work on climate change and sustainability in India have guided her to work on two major bodies of work, which are critical membrane and salt lab, which happened between 2012 and 2019. And trying to get us to think about the collaboration of art science during this crucial time, when we are feeling the impacts of climate variability and change get us to think about how can they offer an innovative space that can help us to rethink the current notion of progress? How can multidisciplinary collaborations help us to notice, observe our entanglement, enmeshment with our other kin, who are maybe we call non-human or more than human? And how can we connect and how can they connect to the work to towards transforming our thoughts and societies to address the urgencies of our time? And how can they teach us to inhabit our world in new non-toxic ways? These are the things and the questions that Sonia will be talking and asking and guide us through. And as part of the multi-species world making possibilities in the more than human Anthropocene speaker series created by Maya Kovskaya, organized by the Alma Mundi Multi-Species Ecological World Making Lab, and also kindly hosted by the Integrative Center of for Humanities Innovations and RCSD at Chiang Mai University. And tonight, we would like to also acknowledge that this land on which we speak, work, and live among us belongs to all turns of beings in the past, present, and future including the many diverse indigenous peoples who came here, made homes long before there were nations or states. So now it is time that we proudly would like to invite Sonia to join us and take the floor. Thank you so much, Aria. That was such a warm uh, welcome. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And my very, very special thanks to Maya and also the Amormundi lab for this invitation. Without any further delay, I'm just going to share my screen. And so since a decade, my collaborative projects have initiated me into a complex and multifaceted understanding of the ethical and political dimensions of scientific research. The works have served as a reminder of the human interconnectedness with the environment 
and the dire side effects the relentless pursuit of economic growth could have on it. I would say that my art practice is inextricably linked to an ethic, even a politics of multi-species coexistence and cohabitation. And so I ask, how do political and economic activities come to shape the centers of our worlds, the tissues, fibers, and forms of its lands and water bodies? How is the movement of non-humans remade through anthropogenic activities? And overall, it is my hope that cross-disciplinary collaborations might help us to explore new ways of sensing, caring, and noticing the world around us. I believe that art-science collaborations have the potential to create new knowledge, ideas, and processes. I think the significant question is, how can artists and scientists come together in collaborations that will benefit all players, including the public? How can they connect to work towards transforming our thoughts and our societies to address the urgencies of our times? And how can they teach us to inhabit our world in new and non-toxic ways? So three powerful, evocative, and thought-provoking words come to mind. Multi-species sustainability, polyphonic assemblages, and intra-action. I believe we need a new multi-species definition and understanding of sustainability that recognizes that living beings and their well-being are interdependent. Traditionally, sustainability means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But because nature is regarded only as a resource or a reserve, our notions of sustainability fail to recognize that humans and other living organisms depend on each other for their sustenance as well as for their well being. The focus of sustainability on human well being and preservation is often a utilitarian perception of nature as a resource for mankind. Therefore, true sustainability can only be achieved if the interdependent needs of all species, of current and future generations, are met. And so we need a new way of thinking with and towards a multi-species sustainability. Secondly, the word intra-action is a Baradian term used to replace interaction. Intra-action understands agency as not an inherent property of an individual or human to be exercised, but as a dynamism of forces. These words allow me to think differently about the world that we inhabit, a world that might otherwise present itself as easily understood. The words or concepts are a critical part of opening up a whole new landscape where the ethical, the ontological, and the epistemological are all in very interesting ways deeply interwoven with each other. Rather than limit our analysis to one creature at a time, and this of course includes humans, or even one relationship, if we want to know what, what makes places livable, we should be studying polyphonic assemblages, gatherings of ways of being. Assemblages are performances of livability. Organisms don't have to show their human equivalence as conscious agents, as intentional communicators, or even as ethical subjects to really count. If we are interested in livability, we should be watching the action of landscape assemblages because these assemblages coalesce, they change, and they dissolve. And this is the story. Um, my button isn't working here, so I'm going to stop share and start that again. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, great. Okay, so the first body of work that I will discuss today is Entanglements of Tide and Time and Tide. And this is an ongoing research-based art science engagement project that explores the North Sea and its tidal zones in their ecological, cultural, political, economic, and poetic capacity. The first work that I would like to talk about in this series is called The Non-Human Touch. And this film raises pertinent questions. And so in this film, I advocate for livable collaborations and rethinking bacteria as partners in the health and survival of all living species. The starting point for the film is a field visit to the ruins of Cramond Island, a Scottish defense site from World War II where I explored the manifold life forms that inhabit tidal zones. The film further investigates the potential of co cohabitation and contamination 
for sustaining all life on Earth, whereby a parallel can be drawn to the history of the wartime site and the ongoing anthropogenic activities within the site that slowly become invaded by microbes that take back its place. And so across a causeway in the middle of the Firth of Forth lies the ghost island of Cremont, Cremont Island is a desolate tidal island about one mile out to sea, which is connected to the mainland at low tide across the drum sands. So for those of you who are not really aware of this location, Firth of Forth is the estuary of several Scottish rivers that meets the North Sea and ultimately this will meet the Atlantic Ocean. This causeway runs at the foot of a row of concrete pylons, and you can see this in the image on the right side which were constructed as an anti-boat boom during World War II. At high tide, the path is immersed by several feet of seawater, which cuts, off, cuts the island off from the mainland. Scotland suffered more than 500 German air raids during the course of World War II. At the outbreak of World War II, Tramont Island, along with other islands in the fort, was re-fortified and armed, designed specifically to tackle fast-moving torpedo boats. The island is dotted with wartime ruins. The image on the left shows us the views of the anti-shipping barrier that runs from Cremont Island to, to Cremont, and it shows the construction work in various phases, and this image is from 1940. And um, the following image, here you see the World War II era fortifications on the island. The causeway is slick with seawater and a green of slippery, slimy, glossy, and gleaming algae the tide recently having receded to a remote, secure remoteness. The crumbling, corroding, putrefying power of nature slowly creates new meaningful forms. Nature has now made it her own. The concrete ruin is consumed by nature, engulfed and appropriate creatures revel. Living material is collected from various environments of the zone. I think about the life forms that inhabit tidal zones far beyond just the human ones. I start to wonder what does cohabitation mean in an era of many urgencies with accelerating rates of species extinctions? What is the association between capitalist devastation and collaborative survival within multi-species landscape? What is the prerequisite for sustaining all life on Earth? What enigmas and nightmares lie beneath the palpable. Back in the laboratory, we decided to construct devices for culturing a large diversity of microorganisms, unique miniature microbial ecosystems or microbial gardens reusing the collected habitat. Once prepared, the column is a self-sustaining and closed ecosystem dependent only on input of light as an exogenous energy force. Much like a gardener tending to his plants, providing the finest conditions for a plant species to grow, a column provides a rich environment for microbes to grow or bloom as a lush population. The prepared columns were observed over several months for development of layers, smells, colors, and zones. As the microbes in the soil photosynthesize pigments, we are exposed to the processes of growth and decomposition of various species of bacteria within this ecosystem with variations in populations observed through waves of color. We see the growth and flourishing of various microorganisms such as chlorobium, chromatium, begiatoa, desulfovibrio, as well as rhodomicrobium. In addition, we can also see the growth of algae and cyanobacteria. These are predominantly present on the upper uh, parts of the column and you can see the green growth and that is the cyanobacteria and the algae. Bacteria were amongst the first life forms to appear on Earth and are present in most of its habitats. Bacteria also live in symbiotic and parasitic relationships with plants and animals. Most bacteria have not been characterized. And it's really interesting that only about 27% of the bacterial phyla have species that can be grown in a laboratory. Bacteria were first observed by Anton van Leeuwenhoek in the late 17th century, but didn't become the objects of significant study until 19th century when it became apparent that some species caused human diseases. During the middle of the 20th century, bacteria became widely accepted subjects of empirical studies in fields such as genetics, genetic engineering, and biochemistry. 
and we will discuss this further uh, with one of my other projects called the Salt Labs as we go along. Today, biologists face the conceptual challenge of rethinking bacteria as partners in, in health. According to animal physiologist and biochemist, the most wonderful professor, Margaret McFall Nye, human bodies can no longer be seen as fortresses to defend against microbial assault, but must be re-envisioned as nested ecosystems. So working with biological processes and structures can be both challenging and provocative. However, working with this li lively material um, in the laboratory brings with it a range of ethical, social, cultural, and aesthetic inquiries. What constitutes life? Who gets to determine what lives are created and grown, which are saved, exploited, or destroyed? What do we think about using this lively material, such as tissues, bacteria, living organisms, and life process as a medium? What does it mean to have agency and ownership over another's life? What do we think of human beings as makers? What do we think about the disposal of these lively objects that soon become infectious laboratory waste? What does it mean to be at risk with one another? What are then the possibilities and limitations of working with other than human life? What do we think of contamination? And so here are some film stills uh, which show excerpts from certain public, uh, published papers and articles on contamination at Cremont Island and Cremont Beach. The boundaries of the city of Edinburgh close, uh, enclose some 15 kilometers of coastline on the southern shore of the Firth of Forth. All of it is to some degree polluted by domestic and industrial waste, discharged untreated, mostly below low water mark. Cremant Beach was um, being found to have levels of sewage higher than the limit laid down by the European Union. The water does not meet quality standards, meaning the shellfish contaminated with harmful bacteria could have found its way onto people's plate. It is illegal to harvest shellfish for commercial purposes unless the water meets certain quality standards. Up to about 100 kilos of contaminated shellfish destined for Lothian restaurants has been seized by police near Cremont Island. Which brings me to a related body of work, speculative harboring living landscapes. And so here you see living systems, air, soil, seawater, biofilms, glass, additive nutrients, and supplementation, including carbon and sulfur sources various microbes in phases of growth and decay, including cyanobacteria and algae, sugars and oxygen. The anthropologist Anna Zing says, the ev evolution of ourselves is already polluted by histories of encounter. They change who we are and they make way for others. As contamination changes world-making projects, mutual worlds and new directions may emerge. We all carry a history of contamination. Purity is not an option. Staying alive for every species requires livable collaboration. And collaboration means working across differences and this leads to contamination. Contamination makes multiplicity and diversity. Contaminated diversity is therefore convoluted, often abysmal and humbling. So there is a frightening collision then between the potentials and confines of human and non-human life caught between the webs of nightmares and dreams. I'm going to move to the next work in this series, Vital to Life, Drifters and Wanderers. And so a selection of archival historical microscope slides of diatoms found in UK waters dated dating between 1807 and 1932 from the collection of Mr. Colin Sanderson were used for Vital to Life and the series Drifters and Wanderers. Diatoms are a major group of algae, specifically microalgae, found in the oceans, waterways, and soils of the world. Living diatoms number in the trillions. They generate nearly 50% of the oxygen produced in the planet each year. They take in over 6.7 billion metric tons of silicon each year from the waters in which they live and contribute nearly half of the organic material found in the oceans. 
Diatoms are used to monitor past and present environmental conditions and are commonly used in the studies of water quality. Thus, diatoms are an important component of environmental assessment. And so looking at the mysterious and enigmatic life plankton provides several entry points to understanding larger global issues associated with the world's oceans in these troubled times. Drawing on the work of evolutionary theorist, biologist and science author Lynn Margulis and animal physiologist and biochemist, Professor Margaret McFall Knight, vital to life makes the invisible world of microorganisms visible, revealing hidden worlds lying beyond the scope of the human eye. What was very interesting for me during this period was the endless possibilities through which laboratory-based work and images could not only inspire my art, but also translate to a rigorous studio-based artistic practice while communicating key messages. I was keen to explore these new insights, synergies, interactions, and collaborative processes. So the photo micrographs created by me at ASCUS Art and Science Laboratory in Edinburgh inspired the making of these large scale, meticulously produced engravings at Edinburgh Printmakers, which were conceptualized and produced during a print residency in collaboration with the printmakers from 2018 to 2021. I was interested in looking at these slippages of time and the idea of navigating between past, present and future worlds but also thinking about how technologies have come to shape our perception and understanding of the natural world. So during a good part of the 19th century, which is the Victorian era, I, a peek through a microscope could reveal very different sites than the ones we'd ex expect to see today. In the mid to late 1800s, microscopes were not only instruments of scientific discovery, but they were tools for popular entertainment, especially in Britain and an in industry of inventive slide makers sprung up to feel the, feed the public appetite for this new way of seeing. However, biologists such as, such as Thomas Huxley saw the microscope as an important instrument in the laboratory of the professional scientists where he believed that science should be done. Ultimately, this might have contributed to the microscope's waning popularity later on in the century. The microscope became an instrument for professional scientists science became more specialized and less accessible to everyone. And the notion of using the microscope to uncover the awe of the natural world then began to fade. These are the slides of the diatoms that I worked with. And most of this uh, were from uh, the series made by W. Watson Sons and Son in London. These are images of me working uh, at the ASCUS laboratory in Edinburgh. And on the bottom left, you can see me uh, working during a field visit to Cremont Island. Drifters and Wanderers, Plankton Chronicles 1. These are images and my work on zooplankton. Zooplankton are small floating or weakly swimming organisms that drift with water currents and together with phytoplankton, they make up the planktonic food supply upon which all oceanic organisms are ultimately dependent. Individual zooplankton are usually microscopic, but some, such as jellyfish, these are larger and obviously they are visible to the naked eye. So zooplankton are basically the animal component of the planktonic community. The zooplankton samples in sea waters for this body of work was provided by Marine Scotland from their coastal monitoring site in Stone Stonehaven on the east coast of Scotland. The sample was specially collected from their site for the project and it was largely unpreserved. I viewed and observed the samples through these microscopes over a period of 10 days, which included a recording of various phases of decay in progress. Once again, the works reveal the hidden, mysterious, and wondrous world of zooplankton, these exquisite critters that are not only such a vital part of the marine food web, but they also play an important role as recyclers of carbon. In addition to viewing and working with live samples, I also looked at historical slides from the collection of the Ecology and Conservation Group of Marine Scotland. And uh, according to some of the scientists at the laboratory, 
it is very possible that some of these species of critters are already ex extinct in the wild. And these are the slides, the zooplankton that I worked with. And I thought it would be interesting also to share with you some of the research notes and behind the scene images, as well as some of my communication with scientists. And so this is the uh, Marine Laboratory uh, Research Facility of Marine Scotland uh, in Aberdeen, where I worked between 2018 and 2021, made several visits to this place. Below is the actual sample, which is actually placed on the microscope to view the phy phytoplankton. And this was a very interesting collaboration with Professor Colin Moffat. This is some of my communication with uh, Dr. Eileen Bresnan, and she is the phytoplankton ecology group leader at Marine Scotland. And so the first set of images are electron, uh, transmission electron microscope images of the diatom species Ketoceros. The second uh, species is the Thalassiosyra. And this is a particularly interesting one because you can see a lot of pores of different sizes on the frustules. Thalassiosyra, they, they play a very important role in the spring diatom bloom in Scottish waters. The third species is Pseudonychia. And this is, it's really interesting because some of these species produce, uh, you know, these toxins that can render the shellfish that feed on it unfit for human consumption. And these samples were again collected from the Stonehaven monitoring site, which is one of the important monitoring sites of the Marine Scotland. Uh, the following images are through my communication with uh, zooplankton ecologists Daphne Erkis Madrano and Shona Wells at the Marine Labs. And so on the left, you can see the decapod Megalutha. That's like a crab larva. And uh, you see Lysia blondina, another species of zooplankton here. And of course, these are uh, many species uh, on the left and some other images also of copepods and calanuses. Uh, this is a typical copy pod and you can see this little critter with the eggs and this is a very common sight in the Atlantic Ocean. Here you see preserved zooplankton samples that have been collected for, from the site and I had observed these planktons under a microscope at the Marine Laboratory in 2019 and so essentially uh, these are collected uh, through a very fine net, and then uh, you know they are they are uh, preserved in certain bottles, certain kind of de um, dedicated bottles. And so uh, what I did was to pour them into the petri dishes and first observe the entire petri dish under a microscope, and then slowly, in order to study uh, individual creatures, you would just um, isolate one, for instance, to get a detailed image such as this. This is an interesting image because it shows you the variation in, in the sizes of these little critters. And these are further image, or further images. These are from dark field microscopic images. And uh, you can see the chaotic uh, profusion of these uh, zooplankton in the sample. Another image. And as I mentioned that these are collected in very special bottles. So here you can see on the left side, you see the black, bottle for collecting phytoplankton on the right, the zooplankton on the left, uh, phosphates and nitrates, nutrient silicates uh, below, and dissolved oxygen bottle on the right. And now this is, a, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is some of my communication with uh, Dr. Mary Russell, and she's a senior environmental scientist at the Marine um, Scotland. And uh, these are images of microfibers uh, from the North Sea, Atlantic Ocean. And to give you an idea of scale, these pictures have been taken uh, against a background of one millimeter square boxes as such. And so if you look at this image on the left here, oh, sorry, let me just go back there. Um, you can see an orange fiber, which is uh, degrading at one end uh, with its bits 
uh, sort of pulling off and it's also become entangled with a very thin, long uh, white fiber. This image on the right is uh, particularly interesting to me. So this is the white fiber splitting at one end and uh, this is tangled with smaller pieces of plastic and the dark brown material that you see there is likely, most likely organic in nature. And so bigger pieces of net can ghost fish in that they continue to collect fish after being discarded or lost at sea. And so this little fiber is ghost microplastic collecting having accumulated the smaller pieces of plastic while floating around in the sea. And here you have uh, another image. And so on the top, you see that these spheres are actually plastic nurdles. And for, you, for those of you who are not really aware of this word nurdles, they are the pre-production pellets for plastic products. And so they are 5 mm in diameter. And they are abundantly now found uh, you know, in the sea and in the sand, uh, on the beaches, um, so on and so forth. And just below that, uh, you have your very typical plastic material from a from a commercial face scrub, for instance. And the, this has two components. You have the blue spheres and the white irregular plastic parts. And for size comparison, you have the third component, which is a human hair. And so now I thought it'll be, um, it'd be nice to share some images of some of my field visits uh, to the Faulshio Coastal Nature Reserve in Kinkandashe, but also my visit to the Forby National Nature Reserve. And the idea was to visit these sites along with um, scientists and ecologists to understand better the food webs and the trophic levels in the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. So basically the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, and then the sand eels. And essentially for those who you are not aware of what sand eels are, they're really small fish that essentially feed on zooplankton. And then of course, higher up in the trophic level, you have the puffin, the kitty wakes, the gilly moths, and the razor bills. And so this is an image uh, that I have taken, and this is a view of the spectacular cliffs of Palshu. And, um, you know, uh, these are packed with thousands of seabirds during the spring and summer months, uh, the time that I visited. And these birds include gilly moths, razor bills, and kitty wakes. And we also saw puffins and fulmers. And this is a close up of the colonies, one of the colonies. And this is typically your razor bill and uh, gilly moth colony. A close up of the guillemots, these beautiful birds, the razor bills, and of course a very common sight in Scotland and all over the all over UK, the, the herring gull. This is an image that I took um, at the Forby National Nature Reserve. And uh, you see here the sands of Forby and uh, these very little, you know, very least disturbed uh, open grasslands, so to say. And here you see the Ethan estuary of the Ethan River and the, the seal colonies here. And of course, here you're seeing both the gray seals and the harbor seals. looking ahead, the North Sea. And so Dr. Barbara Burke says, the impacts of climate change have already been observed in Scottish Scotland seas with evidence of warming seas and increasing sea levels, for example. These changes are increasingly having an impact on the marine ecosystem. So on the left, you see a map showing plankton sampling locations providing data used in the assessment. According to Marine Scotland's assessment report 2020, and you can, uh, you can all really access this online, significant changes in the plankton community have occurred in some marine regions over the last three decades. The effects of these changes are not known, but this observed ecological reorganization could have significant impact on the entire marine food web. And so in the first two charts, uh, you can see that there is an increasing trend in both diatoms and dinoflagellates. This chart, these two charts show us declining trends in both small and large copepods. And these are consistent with trends reports in greater North Sea, as well as the entire North Atlantic. 
And this is now a really alarming chart. And this shows a significant declining trend in the annual abundances of total zooplankton at Loch Eo. And uh, I was discussing this with the scientists that, you know, there is, uh, you know, now evidence of this so-called trophic mismatch, which means basically the, the prey predator uh, mismatch, so to say, and this has grave consequences for the entire marine food web. So essentially they were uh, collating this report at the time that I was visiting and they were looking at this relationship and this mismatch because of all these various factors. Uh, between the copy pod, the sand deals, and the kitty whales, for instance. And now I'm going to move away from the UK waters, Scotland, Atlantic Ocean, and come closer to home with this body of work, the Salt Lab. And this body of work was created between 2017 and 2019, and some part of it is still ongoing. The Salt Lab brings traditional knowledges into dialogue with contemporary art and science in critical zones and ecological hotspots in India. This ongoing project examines the effects of salinity on food systems and food crops, comparing both transgenic tobacco, tobacco plants modified with genetic material from mangroves and more than about 20 indigenous coastal saline tolerant rice cultivars, such as Pokali, Matla, Kaksal, Nona Kopra, Nona Sorain, Ghias, Rupsal, among others, which have been cultivated in a laboratory. The salt lab raises, analyzes, and probes cultural, philosophical, ethical, and social questions connected with scientific and technological research, all of which contest our assumptions about our relationship with science, technology, and the environment. And so drawing data and vital information from the fields of biotechnology, microbiology, ecotechnology, the artistic investigation speculates about a future where the transgenic becomes vital for human survival. While we become aware of the tools used to create new hybrid life forms through the role of genetic engineering, we perceive that to create new life forms, we must work within the boundaries of ethics, biosafety, and biosecurity. So these archival photographs are accompanied by texts based on my conversations with scientists, researchers, activists, ecologists, and local communities, but also based on my field notes. And so Dr. M. Swaminathan, the world-renowned geneticist says, um, genetic In English, a summons complaint And so, um, according to Dr. Professor M. Swaminathan, genetic variability becomes very limited if you take genetic modification, because with one or two varieties, you cover large areas. Bt cotton, for example, covers large areas, and that is always dangerous. Genetic homogeneity increases genetic vulnerability, diseases, and pests, and therefore, you have to be careful. Dr. Anura Purkud, on the other hand, says, that I think there are bigger economic and social problems to consider when one thinks about the ownership of seeds. He continues to say, okay, so there is, again, this is caught. I think this is stuck again, so I'm going to have to do this again. Um, stop share. Okay, so he continues by saying that when margins are slender, vulnerability to adverse climate is magnified. Sometimes this is a chronic and steadily worsening process that encourages migration with its own consequences, or even worse consequences with catastrophic climate events. And so food shocks are really a part of this. Now, 
Dr. Gayatri Venkatraman, the principal scientist at MSSRF India, and also a chief biotechnologist there, but the idea being that mangroves being salt tolerant species, we can look at traits which they possess. And hopefully if these traits are transferred to cultivated rice, we will be able to get salinity tolerance. So one of the genes which was transformed into cultivated rice is from the mangrove species Abyssinia marina. So this gene was introduced into a cultivated rice variety called Pusa basmati and then after the usual testing, which is molecular testing, to ensure that the gene had been introduced, it was tested in limited field trials in the campus within the atomic power plant in Kalpakam where it did show tolerance to 150 millimolar of salt and also to a great degree drought tolerance. In the video altered growth, the tobacco plant has been impregnated with genes from a mangrove species. Tobacco is widely used as a model plant in transgenic research for abiotic stress tolerance in agricultural crops. Recreated from nearly 100 photographs of transgenic tobacco plants taken in a laboratory in Chennai over a period of six months, the animated video shows the transgenic tobacco plant in various phases of growth and proliferation in petri dishes. Another video, this is a set of three intimate videos, show us the tissue specific expression of AMPM3 GFP fusion or the green fluorescent protein in transgenic tobacco plant. So here you see the root leaf petiole and stem of the tobacco plant and the green parts that you see, that the highlighted glowing green parts, that is the AMPM3 promoter, which is de derived from the mangrove plant species of Isenia marina. So essentially you see the mangrove genes expressing inside a tobacco plant in the run up to a test for salinity tolerance in rice. And I'm going to end this particular section with a quotation by the brilliant scientist, North Stefano Mancuso, where he says that the state of plant conservation and the rising evidence that plants are sentient beings should make people consider something really radical, plant rights. A discussion about plant rights is no longer deferable. The road to rights is always difficult, but it is necessary. Providing rights to plants is a way to prevent our own ex extinction. We depend on plants, this plant conservation is necessary for man conservation. These are images of me working at the MSSRF um, laboratory in Chennai. This brings me to the last body of work um, that I'd like to talk about today, which is critical membrane. And this body of work addresses itself to the mangrove ecologies of India's Coromandel and Malabar coast, located respectively in the states of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. My exploration of these regions has been inspired by an awareness of impending ecological catastrophe. The mangroves are an osmotic border between land and sea and are under grave threat from direct human interference. Cultural theorist um, and writer Ranjit Hoskote says, and I quote about the series, critical membrane reminds us of the epical cost that human, who humankind must pay for its economic expansionism, a logic set in motion during the industrial revolution and supported by the contract, contractarian ideology and extractive practices of global capital. The philosopher Akhil Bilgrami has memorably phrased it, this paradigm has replaced nature with natural resources, communities with populations, and the knowledge to live by with an expertise to rule by. By contrast, research across a range of disciplines has encouraged us with increasing urgency in recent decades to embrace the understanding that we inhabit complex webs of stimulus and response, intervention and repercussion. And so I bring um, together a variety of impulses ranging from microscopic details of bacterial and microbial cultures to documentary cinematic studies of marginalized groups whose eco-sensitive occupations have suffered as a result of the decline in their environment.
tied to the fragility of these ecosystems is the ecological and livelihood security of the coastal communities. Rising sea temperatures and changes in coastal shorelines due to climate change, along with chronic human misuse of ecosystems, such as overfishing or pollution, are paving the way towards an apocalyptic future. The films explore the traditional skills, indigenous knowledge systems, and fishing technique used by fisher folk that are under threat and at the risk of being replaced by modern, unsustainable technologies that damage ecosystems. In the Muthupet mangrove forests in Tamil Nadu, a 200 year old traditional method of fishing in the wetlands could be the key to restoring vast degraded mangrove belts across the country. In the crowded fish landing centers of Tamil Nadu in Kerala, Experienced local fishermen discuss a severe crisis that is sweeping India's coasts and its fishing grounds, the possible cost causes of fish mortality, declining fish catch, and its consequences on their livelihood. In the Pichavaram wetlands, a forgotten tribe is already practicing a new way of life, of managing and conserving the biodiverse mangrove forests and are pointing the way forward to a sustainable future. And I'm going to end this presentation with this last set of work, which is a set of archival prints called Universe in Details, unveiling the, the, the diversity and structure of microbial communities in mangrove environments is the first step in understanding their role in the functioning of this ecosystem. The rise of sphere microorganisms contribute to the productivity of the mangroves and also maintain plant health and overall ecosystem resilience. And so through this body of work, I ask, what are the multi-species mixes that make up our worlds? What does cohabitation mean in an era of many urgencies with accelerating rates of species extinctions? Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Wow, thank you, Sonia. This is incredible. Like, um, I always amazed with and fascinated with all the works that you have shown us as well. And welcome, Maya, to join us. Um, if Hi, everybody. So, Maya is our curator. My computer is on death's door, so it might not be visible, but. I am blown away by all the amazing things that Sonia has shared with us. And I can't wait for our round table discussion to begin. Okay, well, we'll move on to the round table discussions. And um, in the meantime, if our audience have any questions or comments, please use the chat box and type them up. And then we'll, um, as I introduce our discussions to join the, the round table, we'll be really happy to see what you have for, um, for us as well. Um, so for today, during the roundtable discussion, we have three amazing artists, writers to join us together. After we hear all these stimulating talk by Sonia, it's very much like a thought provoking, action provoking talk as well. And to think about how these interactions would get us thinking and discuss more. Um, and of course, you, you can always find out more about our work through the websites and also the fan page. So first, um, I'd like to introduce Rushdi Anwa, who is a visual artist, a researcher, silent activist, community engager, social equity seeker, and academic who lives between Melbourne, Australia and Chiang Mai, Thailand. He is currently a lecturer at the Fine Arts Faculty at Chiang Mai University. And he has received numerous grants awards, um, has facilitated, curated many forums and lectures at universities and public galleries, museums and art spaces. He co-founded and coordinated the Australian Thai Artists Exchange, Interchange, which is an organization that founded to research on socio-political and cross-cultural exchange. 
awareness of art and culture between Thais and Australians. Um, he also has held solo and group exhibitions in all over the world, including one here in Thailand at the Bangkok Art Piano, and also one in China and also at Cuba. His public collections are being, uh, has been held in art galleries around the world as well, from Australia to Vietnam, as well as Kurdistan in uh, many places. Um, and our next discussant is Pietro Locasto. Pietro is an artist working with images and video and a member of our Amu Mundi Lab. He is currently um, doing his MFA at the Visual Arts in Chiang Mai University as well, but he has studied geo I mean, photography at Patshala Institute in Bangladesh. Um, Pietro sees his work more as a artistic research on the possibility to participate in visualization of post-human paths that is driven more and more on the collective conceptual creativity which I believe it co-links with the collaboration that Sonia has been discussing as well. His recent work uh, to search the secret of the forest, which includes the acts of denunciation of structural injustice towards indigenous knowledge and other non-humans, which may define as animals, plants, and land in an attempt to understand and deepen the multi-level relationship between humans and natures. His work has been selected to be exhibited in many places, including Singapore International Photography. And he is um, a, one of the three winners of the 15th edition of Canon Young Photographers Award. And our third discussant tonight is Blake Palmer. He is a writer and cultural critique based here in Chiang Mai, Thailand, working on popular culture including film, music, tech culture, Asian contemporary art, particularly on the East and Southeast Asia. His research interests focus on the intersection of culture, power, and art as a vector of sociopolitical critique. He is a regular contributor at, um, to Art and Market, a multimedia publication focused on Southeast Asian art. He was a film critique and uh, he has written so many blogs as well. And he also worked as an editor and music reviewer for Gat House. His work also appears in many um, places, including the most recent edition of the art journal called Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art in Asia. His recent work includes ethnographic research conducted alongside with Thai chefs and food activists investigating sustainable food practices and funeral traditions in Thailand. You can also find out more about his upcoming book, Bring Me Curry When I'm Gone. He's also currently developing several in-depth graphical critical essays on numbers of artists working throughout Asia and writing a novel and Gothic tradition in, of the American South. So welcome all discussants to the floor and um, let's have a really, really lively discussions tonight. I will unmute, okay. Well, I don't know what- I don't see that. our discussants on screen. Is there a way to see all four people at once? Yeah, let me add the spotlight for everyone right now. Uh, I'm not even a real discussant, so. Hi, Blake. Hi, Rushdi. Hi, Pietro. Uh, Thank you so hi. much for joining us. I'm not a real discussant. I'm just trying to sneak in the background and learn from you guys. <laughs> Don't need to highlight me. <laughs> um. Well, Sonia, if I can just jump in with kind of a question about your work, I'm not sure what our protocol is for this discussion, so I'll just start blabbering. Um, for sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in your work with live bacterial cultures, um, uh, especially in as a um, kind of a microcosm of intra-agency uh, creative work. 
uh, in that you know, your actions uh, both limit and expand what is possible, uh, what possible ways the uh, bacteria can express their agency and the bacterial agency uh, both limits and expands uh, the outcome of your artistic creative endeavor. Uh, and I enjoy seeing that example of uh, collaborative interspecies art. Uh, and I'm curious what you uh, learned uh, in that attempt at a uh, creative collaboration, both what was frustrating, what was limiting, what was exciting, and if there was anything that you learned that opens up possibilities for how we can learn to collaborate uh, so, beyond the realm of creativity and art. So this is a really interesting question, I think. Thank you for that, Blake. And um, I think, I think one of the points of this film, The Non-Human Touch, and I hope at some point, uh, you know, we, uh, I would like to share a link for everybody to be able to watch that film. It's ongoing right now as a part of the Edinburgh Art Festival at the moment. But uh, I think one of the points in this film was to, was to talk about these vulnerabilities from an art artistic position and therefore raise questions that are related to the ethical dimension of scientific research as well. And so um, initially when I worked, um, you know, I don't have a background in science. So initially when I worked on earlier projects such as critical membrane on the mangrove ecosystems and I worked with Indian scientists in the south, uh, southern part of India in Chennai, uh, it was pretty much a kind of a collaboration where the scientists would do the culturing themselves and I would sort of observe, discuss, document and it sort of it moved in that direction. But in Scotland in more recent times, uh, the microbiology, microscopy, all of these aspects was something that I was sort of trained to do myself as a part of the resident artist there. And so that changed everything for me. Because when you are working with this kind of lively material uh, coming from this kind of creative sphere, I think there are, there are uh, all of these kind of uh, these questions that come up which are neither black nor white. And so you sort of, you come into this entire gray zone where you're, you're, you're creating the work, but you're questioning your act actions at the same time, you know? And so what it does is that the film exposes these kind of vulnerabilities when you work with this lively uh, material. And I think the first question and the most important question that it deals with it is the, on the subject of agency. And that is a really important word because, you know, who gets the idea that, uh, you know, I have this part in the film where I, where I ask myself is that who gets to decide which lives are grown, what is created, what is used, and then what becomes this infectious laboratory waste? Because at the end of the so-called project, and I refer, I, I sort of, I talk about all kinds of bio art here, that there is a certain protocol through which this kind of material must be disposed of, right? And so when you're, you're living and you're working with this microbe, and I literally, I, I created this work, Speculative Harboring, uh, in 2019, in, in April, and it continues to live and grow in the laboratory. It's also part of my solo exhibition in Edinburgh at the moment. So, you know, through these, these couple of years, these two years or more, these microbes have sort of grown, they flourished, they decayed, you know, new colonies have come up and, and one has been observing these. So on one level, uh, you know, having, having done this process uh, myself, I feel like on one level, they're also kind of progeny. And then the idea of then, you know, having to destroy this as, as some kind of a waste, which could be potentially infectious, this is quite disturbing now. And so, you know, the, the whole question about hierarchies comes into play, play here. And so, yes, we do talk about multi-species uh, collaborations, but then I think it's also very necessary for us to try to understand, to take a step back and understand our own position uh, within this dialogue. And so I'm quite open about exposing these kind of vulnerabilities as I work and as I move along, because I think as part of what I do, I think addressing these kind of questions, these deeper questions and layers while you work is very important, sort of unraveling these layers as you work along. Yeah, I love that you openly wrestled with those. I watched your video. I, I love that you openly wrestled with those in the, in the video uh, because um, I think that really got me thinking. And I'm not I'm not sure if I have a comfortable position on on what the line is there. And and I exactly think, think yeah. to see you 
see the wheels turn for you as you were actively engaged in the work. Exactly. I, uh, thank you, Sonia. I mean, I, I'm mesmerized by your work. I, I found fascinating, you know, this idea of, uh, of struggling uh, with questioning, you know, and, and yeah. I think, you know, also uh, from a little experience that I have compared to you, but uh, staying, staying with those questions and staying with those doubts is what pushes the work further. And, uh, and I can really, uh, I find fascinating to see how your work sort of as, uh, you started from probably from the, from the end, but you started from, um, now I know that you're not, you don't have a scientific background and you know, it's fascinating that you seem super knowledgeable. Uh, so you learned a lot in the process, but you started working from with, with communities and, and yeah. then you also, and then you moved to working with, with science uh, or scientists. So very different um, collaborators, yeah. right? Uh, so Absolutely. I was also, yes. yeah. I was just so interested to uh, to hear your experience in in a, you know working collaborating with um, with communities and and uh, with indigenous knowledge and then moving on to collaborating uh, with with science and scientists. Mm -hmm. and we know about the different dichotomies that there are. You know. Um... Uh, you know, I'm often asked this question about my engagement with uh, Western science, you know, more uh, in relation to the newer projects that are coming up and even some projects in the future where I'm working with the Botanical Gardens and Botanical Museum of Berlin, for instance. But uh, I think uh, I think what's really very important here is to understand that from my perspective, when I approach a project, I try my level best to do so with an open mind. And so I allow the work in all the in all conditions to develop organically. And so I never, uh, you know, I never get into a project, you know, thinking of the outcome or even having a plan. And I think that's always worked for me going forward. The other thing I believe that although is that although, you know, we, we of course, we're all aware of Western science and the historic controversies related uh, to Western science, whether that's colonialisms or settler col colonialisms or white supremacy or exploitations and eventual uh, ecological degradation, or even the aspect of the tree of life, which I've, all, I've always questioned through my work while working within, uh, you know, scientific institutions even. What I really believe is that we, today we need all kinds of knowledges. So, you know, scientific knowledges, uh, you know, indigenous knowledges. We need knowledges uh, from our very look, you know, local community and our neighborhoods, for instance, to sort of come together. And so after having uh, got this experience over this last nearly maybe 15 years of working on these projects, of which I think we've just seen today a very minuscule part uh, you know, um, there's a much wider practice. But uh, after working in, with all of these projects, I feel like um, there is a space where, uh, you know, uh, these gaps can be bridged. And I feel that, you know, culture and art, they really do belong to that space where this kind of change uh, can happen, uh, can be brought about. And so, uh, yeah, so that, that is very much my belief to, to work within this sphere. Again, when you talk about scientists, for instance, Mm, more often than not, um, I have really started to believe that at the end, we all want the same thing. We want the same thing. But the question is that the only thing is that our, our approaches are very different coming from the arts or, the, or you know, being a cultural practitioner or being a scientist, the, the, our approach is very different. And so I think as an artist and a cultural practitioner, I'm, in, I'm at an advantageous uh, position here because I can ask those questions. You know, I can be that person who exists in that gray space while questioning uh, the activities, for instance, even within uh, the science institutions. And I'm, I, and also, and also that space allows for me to communicate with my audiences. And so it, it becomes a kind of a bridging ground, you know. And so I think, uh, you know, that space is very, very important. It's a lively space. And so, for instance, in the SOL lab series of work where I worked with transgenic biotechnology, for instance, you possibly, a common person, a common person couldn't possibly enter any of those laboratories where this kind of work is being done. The molecular testing is happening in at, at, atomic power plants, for instance. But through my project, and while this, you know, while my project is on, you know, on whether it's an exhibition or through a talk or whatever, uh, the viewer or the audience can enter that space. 
And so those gaps are already bridged. And so the project allows for that kind of communication, that kind of conversation, that kind of dialogue to happen. And it stimulates more conversations going forward. And so I think that is a very crucial, critical space. And so on one level, I'm very, very grateful for these tools, uh, you know, and to be, um, be a part of this space that allows for so much to happen. I like that you kind of characterize yourself as a, as a bridging uh, element uh, between uh, art and science and the viewer. Uh, and I think we experienced that from the viewer's end. What was your experience working with uh, scientists? Were they open to the types of questions that you were asking? Well, um, okay, so there's no uh, easy answer for that. Because, uh, you know, uh, like I said, you know, I've been working, uh, you know, last couple of years between India and Scotland and Germany. And, um, you know, where, if you, wherever you go, when you go to a new place, I mean, you know, uh, you, you meet different groups of people with their own thought processes. Every institution, again, will have their own agendas. That's something to keep in mind as well. And so, uh, you know, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much like, I think communication is a very important word here. And so I'm really, I depend on collaboration and I also depend on friendships. And I feel like, you know, um, friendship is a very important way forward in, in, in our times, you know. And so having, understanding people also, understanding the people I work with, relating to them, that is very important. And so over this period of maybe 10 years or so, uh, I have developed, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, um, you know, my own little community of friends and those include the scientists that I've worked with. And so uh, today I'm very proud to say that, you know, I have this, this blooming relationship with almost all of them, but it, it was not always that way when I started off. You know, there were these questions that they had, like, for instance, like, what, do you, what, what would you possibly want to do with this, for instance, how can this help in any way? You know, those are the kind of questions that came up, for instance. Or questions like, you know, are you going to show this in a negative light, for instance? You know, like those, those are the natural questions that sort of came up. But um, moving along and, and uh, you know, once the work uh, happened over periods of time, uh, I think uh, we were all ultimately on the same page and we were all wanting to connect with audiences and, uh, you know, convey uh, these important messages to them as well. Uh, yes, Sonia, congratulations yeah, on the, yeah. the amount of work you have done is, and the research behind it is, uh, uh, is very impressive. And, um, and the quality of work, some of the work is uh, very touching. Uh, on the basis of, uh, in the beginning, uh, in my, the way I observed is, um, you, you start with a project, we done it in Cameron Island. Mm -hmm. in and that's kind of bring back the issues of land and redefining and refining finding and redefining the land in the context of war and politics and the struggle between powers and that's go back to as you know you mentioned during the second world war mm -hmm. what's quite interesting how the politics and and the, and the war uh is impact on the shaping the environment, is impact on the shaping of the, uh, the, 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 the geography of the land as well. But uh, bringing back from this, uh, your project from Mangrove, mm -hmm. which is the, the marshland uh, where contaminated and by urban waste, uh, it's quite a very touching project where is kind of uh, looking at the life, how the urban waste impacting on the life of the people or the nature or the people inhabited it. Uh, that, that project, the marshland, uh, the, the mangrove, is remind me of the we have in, uh, in southern of Iraq, where is a city called Basra. During the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. regime, mm -hmm. uh, we have national in there where the size of this area is the size of wells in England, uh, in UK. Mm -hmm. 
So, and half population, almost a quarter of population of a million, a quarter million of population where I used to live there. But during Iraq, Iran war, and because the population of this area were resisting the regime, so the Saddam Hussein started to contaminate it and started systematically destroy the marshland. And now those area uh, is totally flat. It's become a desert and nothing left over. The only thing is a waste of uh, weapons and destruction left over. Beyond that, with a new um, kind of your project so much remind me those crises now in Middle East happening when you talk about the water and the contamination and the bacteria and the life and the, all these kind of things. Uh, according to the science, is the new crisis is facing the Middle East, especially mm -hmm. Iraq and Syria. And sooner or later, it's already started, sooner or later, 12 million people will be displaced, not by war, by but what? Water, the water absolutely. The water war, wars, uh, you know, that are exactly. predicted. Exactly. And, and during this, the current war, always, as we know, uh, the refugee crisis, now we have it. Uh, in Syria, 6.5 million people were displaced during, since 12, uh, 2012 or 11 when the uh, conflict started until today. But with the crisis of water, it will be 5 million uh, refugees from Syria will be displaced by water. No, the crisis of politics, no, the crisis of war, no ISIS, no any other things, just by what. So yeah. it's quite devastating how the geography of this location, geopolitical geography, is uh, changing. And uh, partially, those crises, as you mentioned in your uh, most of your research, you talked about some of them, is about the issues of. Uh, environmental change and some of them, for example, is a human man-made crisis. We contribute to those change and, and, and we build up, we, we build up our, our, or we make it worse in a sense. And, and this crisis happening in the Middle East is a similar situation like the, the issues you addressed in your project and your, uh, your presentation from different projects where uh, those crises is, uh, it's true, it's a partially is an environmental issue, it's is a global warming, a changing, and as all these issues as we know, but also a partially the neighboring country, for example, Iran and Turkey are doing yeah, this yeah. as well. They use exactly, water yeah. as a political tool yeah. to manipulate Syria and Iraq to push their agenda. For example, as we know, in, we have Euphrates River and Tiger River mm -hmm. in those coming from Turkey all the way down to this city, I call it in Basra in South of Iraq, we call it Shuttle Arab and it's go to the Gulf of Persia. So from Turkey to Gulf of Persia will face the crisis. And thus Iran and Turkey are distributing a lot to this by building dump after dump every day. And, and now 70% of agricultural land of Iraq are lost already. 70% production are decreased. And also we have, a, we have it, uh, those area where now is a, we hear so many times like Hasaka, Aleppo, Araka, and, and all these area we hear from the conflict of ISIS and things where conflict happening in Syria. Now, right now the political conflict unsolved and now the people already, including the refugees, uh, so many refugee camps, already they are moving away because of the water. They have no even drinking water. So the crisis over there, those projects you touched by is, and the mangrove and the other project you done it with a fish map, is absolutely, it's, I could see so much commonality between them. So that's fascinating absolutely. how the disaster we deliver to the world by by human by human greed yeah, and exactly. political greed and the ignorance of politicians and the ignorance of the uh, it's not like science as you work with the science yourself is uh, uh, data and night are 
researching to find out the source of the problem, why this happening, yeah. and it's presenting to us, and they present it to the politician or the people are exactly. policy makers, but they ignorance. Exactly, is, uh, and is, is absolutely. absolutely ignorance. Uh, even they don't, they don't, they don't give a second an opportunity to those people to have a voice or to tell them what's going on because they just want to push their agenda, uh, as we know. And those crises, uh, with my respect, I do believe that global warming is contribute a lot to this, but as much we contribute to that, it's not that nature contribute to that. And it's I also nature. think that um, this discussion has led to really um, deeper discussions. And uh, um, one of the, um, the audience has talked about dams and water, but in the Mekong region, um, situation as well. So um, um, Maya, our curator, also raised her hand. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's um, related to the, the question that Maya Dania has asked, or um, should I give the floor to Maya? Kostana? Maya, I think we'll let her ask. I'll say two words, but then I want Maya Dania to speak because I know she has something really interesting to say. Yeah, um, sure. I just wanted to say I love the way that, that we are scaling between the absolutely micro of micro micro with the tiny organisms that you've been looking at and the macro political connect connections because this type of connectivity and analysis of the connection is precisely what is missing from so many of our disciplinary debates. Um, I see there's an environmental scientist out there in the audience who's like, yeah, we really need more of these conversations. Um, and I think we can't wait for other people to start them for us. This series alone is not enough. We're just one little group of people. I encourage all of you to take the initiative and make conversations, reach out. People are hungry to talk. My students, many of whom are in the audience as well, we've just been reading about how the origins of the state and the dawn of so-called civilization mm -hmm. finds its place in connection with ideas of civilization in relation to sedentary agriculture and human domination over plants, uh, the cultivation and domestication processes of natural forces, plants, fire, other humans, other beings as well. And I think it's important to remember that politics is not just things that governments do, not just things that states enact, but that from the very top to the very bottom, our relationship with every aspect of the natural world is always necessarily and inevitably and unavoidably and irreducibly entangled with power relations. And those power relations are not always the ones that we humans who are steeped still, even against our best strivings, steeps still in this enlightenment idea of man is the master of nature. We do have a huge influence on what happens on the planet, but as we start to study and work with scientists and look at how the natural world functions, we realize that there is so much agency out there that we have no mm -hmm. control over that we rely on and depend on for our myriad systems of living and uh, making worlds and, and making lives and making societies and politics and even our culture rely on collaborations with other species. And then if we took all those species out of the picture, we'd literally have a vacuum and the human species would just vanish. Everything, Absolutely. all of our works would be like the Ozymandian statue in the desert or even the, that wouldn't even be there because we literally could not function without the world that we rely on at every single level, from the microscopic, the microbiomic to the ecological. So this kind of work is just provoking me to think about how through our ordinary practices, whether we're artists or whether we're scholars or scientists or we're journalists or we're writers or we're culture makers, it doesn't really matter. We need to connect across different disciplines with people because none of us have enough knowledge to have enough wisdom or insight to understand what needs to now be done to live in the world in a better way, in a way that's not going to destroy the world for most of us and most of our 
kind of why. So I just wanted to just throw that in there. And now I would love it to turn it over to brilliant Maya Dania, because she is also working on algae. And I think you guys yeah. should talk. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Maya Dania. May I, is, may I throw it over to Maya Dania? Yeah, she has a bit of a migraine. So she asked me to, to read it for her, but um, she really appreciates okay. this talk very much. And um, she's currently um, conducting research on the interconnected lives in the Mekong River and trying to see how the food life or the web of life and the mm -hmm. tropic cascades in Mekong coming all the way from the China area, Tibetan and down to the Delta has created different ways of living. And so her questions after hearing what Sanya has said about what makes lives and what constitutes life. And she's reading uh, the competition of two algae at the moment in the Mekong River. One is um, Cladophora or Kai, and it's going towards extinction because it needs um, an mm -hmm. ecosystem that is basically needs clear running water, but its, its establishment is being destroyed and disrupted by newly built dams and ports. And the other algae, which is Tau or Spirogia, survives, but mostly polluted with cyanobacteria, creating algae bloom, turning the brown Mekong into crystal color like river. The Mekong is known to have this muddy, murky river, and that's what it created lives. So her question is not only asking what makes life, but also what makes life compete to each other between the two algaes and what do why do some lives extinct when some others are mutating or accepting the pollution infused in their life? So this was her question. I think this is both the question and an observation uh, and an answer within itself because pretty much what makes life uh, and new worlds today is contamination. And within her research itself, you know, the fact that one species is uh, driven to a point of extinction and the other one is thriving. And I've seen this a lot, even with the mangrove, certain species will not take those levels of salinity and certain species will and they're hardier and so therefore they will survive. So we are changing the natural order pretty much. And so contamination is what is making, uh, you know, no new worlds. Yeah. Um, and I think when we talk about this, and I really appreciate with the whole idea of porosity as well, because as a geographer, mm -hmm. at least trained in geography, we have big problems with boundary, like, and this more than human Anthropocene is something that makes a lot of us nervous. Um, as time is also concluding, so I think this, um, we don't have many more questions from our audience. Uh, we have really good comments from sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Yu Bei Wu talks about science and she also studies about um, zooplankton or plethoplankton, I'm sorry. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. so I think she, and also a fan of you as well, Sonia, who is also here and she said that she admired your work. So um, I think we have a really good audience who will keep the conversation and dialogues going. Um, so I would like to ask the, Sonia, Pietro, um, Rushdi, and Blake to leave kind of the final, let's say the final words for tonight or today for us to keep thinking and keep asking questions and possibly keep reaching out to many of us in order to move forward or follow your works to get us you know, excited about all of this that you have been sharing with us tonight. Um, for me, it would be pretty much to continue thinking about these four words, multi-species sustainability, polyphonic assemblages, interactions, and contamination. For me, I, the work of uh, Sonia and her uh, practice really makes me think about the idea of immersion, uh, immersive ways of looking, and she has done that with community, but she also does it with microbes in a studio, and I think that that's the way of... Um, of, of look at um, 
things today and, and accept contamination and just, you know, just continue to get your hands dirty and, and look and consider and be open to the multiplicity of, uh, of everything. So when you want to make favorite uh, quotes from your video was you mentioned, uh, I wrote it down, you mentioned the crumbling, corroding, putrefying, putrefying power of nature. Uh, and I love that expression of rot and ruin as a field for uh, genesis and creativity. Uh, and I, I think if I were going to carry on thinking about anything uh, from your work, it would be what we can build and generate and create from uh, a world where there is so much collapse and rot and ruin, uh, both in the natural world and in the systems that we've created to live within it. Um, and thank you for, uh, thank you for creating a, a framework for us to have those thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, for me it's about you work with the science and your research and artwork is so much based on science, which is fantastic. Uh, but then you bring those finding, abstract finding of scientific finding, you bring it to art to create a questions. And in, through that question, you create an atmosphere platform. We all, whoever encounter your artwork to think about two things, moral and ethic, how to respond to the nature and what you do wrong and right. I think that's the most important element in your practice. Thank you. Maya, you were you were saying something. You had a concluding. Yes, point. I just I've been reading the comments, and somebody had to leave, but they what they had a thought that it was an amazing talk and fascinating discussion. And above, somewhere in the chat, somebody mentioned the word friendship, of thinking of things in terms of purity. So I want to connect this sort of scientific with the political again. I think that the creation of our contemporary world has in very many ways revolved around the attempt to create boundaries and ideas of, I want to say, false purity, whether it's nations or ethnicities or groups um, or ideologies, that the idea that we have to somehow protect ourselves against being contaminated by the other and the fears of contamination by those that are different or things that are different has structured so many of our social and cultural and political relations in the world. And in fact, legitimated the vast majority of our economic relations, which are predicated on exploitation, which is justified by saying, oh, those ones are other and different and impure and dirty and less, less than human. And all of nature has been, in fact, relegated to this category. So eco-philosophers like Val Plumwood or eco-political uh, ecology and sociology and historians such as Jason Moore have talked about how the nature of society binary has really shaped capitalism and made all of nature treated like it's cheap and available for exploitation. So I think that when we're thinking about how we need forms of friendship, forms of solidarity, new forms of coming together, not just being as isolated units, but becoming something else, something better together as humans, as animals, and as creatures that need specific types of ecological conditions to live and thrive, along with myriad other creatures who need similar conditions. I want to say that one of the things I got from your work was that we need to perhaps embrace being contaminated by the other exactly. and seek out opportunities. Forget this stupid purity. It's, it's a bullshit lie. It's a fascist ideology we don't need. Let's go for contamination. Let's seek out all the opportunities, whether it's intellectually or across species. But let's, let's mix it up. Let's look for opportunities to contaminate and throw away these false categories of purity, which have done nothing except for justify grotesque words of exploitation and divisions that frankly lessen us rather than make us better and stronger. We don't need them. Let's go on and do something else. Bring on the contamination. And thank you for such an amazing, inspiring, and, and I've learned so much from your talk. I can't wait for the next round two. I want thank to uh, thank um, 
the lab, Maya, and uh, all three of you, um, Blake, uh, Rushdi, and Pietro. I mean, this has been absolutely wonderful experience for me. It's been a very friendly and warm experience as well. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we need many more such friendships uh, going ahead. I think our uh, battles, so to say, are all very much the same. We, we all um, are looking, uh, you know, to do the same thing. Our, our goals are the same. And so we need th this whole idea of building community is just so very important, um, you know, across scales, across geographies. And uh, so just to end with this note, uh, you know, like, you know, this note on an ode to friendship, but also just to also think about the word empathy, you know, where that really comes in, you know, because that word is, uh, the, key, is the key word forward. Okay. And so, okay. Mm. All right. Thank you for a very, very stimulating evening. Then. Thank you so much. Aria. And it's so lovely to Thank meet you, you so Ria. Yeah. We're looking forward to see you on face to face one day, hopefully. Come to Thailand. <laughs> Thank you so Come much. Come to Delhi. Yeah, let's get you here. <laughs> and those of you out there in the hopefully. audience who are sooner than later, alone, hopefully, sooner than later. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. And all of you wonderful people who showed up for this talk tonight, I know it's late for some of you and early for others of you. Um, we really want to do these talks in order to create a community of knowledge makers and idea makers and value makers and culture makers together. So reach out. This is, this is your community too. And we welcome you to, to share what you have to share and to raised provocations and questions and suggest things. And this is a space that we hope to make larger and larger with all of you together. Okay, so join getting likes or something. It's really truly about how we need to create new communities of knowledge makers, value makers, culture makers, idea makers together to create a world that we can live in and that other creatures can live in in the near future. So please join us and thank you for coming to share with this wonderful talk. And Sonia, really, thank you so much. Thank you to the lab and everybody who made all this happen behind the scenes. And Aria, thank you for moderating and introducing since my computer is falling apart here. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been really wonderful. We will have this on YouTube soon so you can share with your friends share on Facebook, share on social media. Let's just keep the energy going. We can't do this alone. And to love and friendship. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.